Traditionis Custodes. This is the incipit of the document with which Francis imperiously counseled the previous motu proprio sumorum pontificum of Benedict XVI. The almost mocking tone of the bombastic quotation from Lumen Gentium would not have escaped notice. Just when Bergoglio recognizes the bishops as guardians of the tradition, he asks them to obstruct his highest and most sacred expression of prayer. Anyone who tries to find within the folds of the text some escamotage to circumvent the text should know that the draft sent to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith for revision was extremely more drastic than the final text. A confirmation, if ever it were needed, that no particular pressure was needed from the historical enemies of the Tridentine liturgy, beginning with the scholars of Sant'Anselmo, to convince his holiness to try his hand at what he does best, demolishing. Ubi solitudine facunt, pace appellant. They make a wasteland and call it peace. Francis has once again disavowed the pious illusion of the hermeneutic of continuity, stating that the coexistence of the Vetus and Novus Ordo is impossible because they are expression of two irreconcilable doctrinal and ecclesiological approaches. On one hand, there is the Apostolic Mass, the voice of the Church of Christ. On the other, there is the Montinian Eucharistic celebration, the voice of the Conciliar Church. And this is not an accusation, however legitimate, made by those who express reservation about the Reform, Rite and Vatican II. Rather, it is an admission, indeed, a proud affirmation of ideological adherence on the part of Francis himself, the head of the most extremist faction and progressivism. His dual role as Pope and liquidator of the Catholic Church allows him, on one hand, to demolish it with decrees and act of government, and on the other hand, to use the prestige of his office entails to establish and spread the new religion over the rubble of the old one. It matters little if the ways in which he act against God, against the Church and against the Lord's flock are in stark conflict with his appeals to parmesia, to dialogue, to building bridges and not erecting walls. The Church of Mercy and the Phil Hospital turn out to be empty rhetorical devices since it ought to be Catholics who benefit from them and not heretic or fornicators. In reality, each of us is well aware that Amoris Laetitia's indulgence toward public concubinage and adulteress would hardly be imaginable to all those rigid ones against whom Bergoglio hurls his dart as soon as he has the opportunity. After years of this pontificate, we have all understood that the reasons given by Bergoglio for declining a meeting with a prelate, a politician or a conservative intellectual do not apply to the molester cardinal, the heretic bishop, the abortionist politician or the globalist intellectual. In short, there is a blatant difference in behavior from which one can grasp the partiality and partisanship of Francis in favor of any ideology, thought, project, scientific, artistic or literary expression that is not Catholic. Anything that even only vaguely evokes 
anything Catholic seems to arouse in the tenants of Santa Marta, an aversion that it is disconcerting to say the least, if only in virtue of the throne on which he is seated. Many have noted this dissociation, this sort of, of bipolarity of a Pope who does not believe like a Pope, doesn't behave like a Pope, does not speak like a Pope. The problem is that we are not faced with a sort of inaction from the papacy, as could happen with the sick of very old pontiffs, but rather with a constant action that is organized and planned in a sense diametrically opposed to the very essence of the papacy. Not only does Bergoglio not condemn the errors of the present time, by strongly reaffirming the truth of the Catholic faith. He has never done this, but he actively seeks to disseminate these errors, to promote them, to encourage their supporters, to spread them on the greatest possible extent, and to host events promoting them in the Vatican, simultaneously silencing those who denounced these same errors. Not only does he not punish fornicating prelates, but even promotes and defends them by lying, while he removes conservative bishops, does not hide his annoyance with the heartfelt appeals of cardinal not aligned with the new course. Not only does he not condemn abortionist politicians who proclaim themselves Catholics, but he intervenes to prevent the Episcopal Conference from pronouncing on this matter, contradicting that synodal path which conversely allows him to use a minority of ultra-progressives to impose his will on the majority of the Synod Fathers. The one constant of this substitute noted in his most present and arrogant form in Traditionis Custodes, is duplicity and lies. A duplicity that is a facade, of course, daily disavowed by position that are anything but prudent in favor of a very specific group, which for the sake of brevity we can identify with the ideological left Indeed, with this most recent revolution in a globalistic, ecologist, transhuman, and LGBTQ key. We have come to a point that even simple people with little knowledge of doctrinal issues understand that we have a non-Catholic Pope, at least in strict sense of the term. This poses some problems of a canonical nature that are not inconsiderable, which it is not up to us to solve, but which sooner or later we have to be addressed. Another significant element of this pontificate, taken to its extreme consequences with traditionis custodes, is Bergoglio's ideological extreme extremism, an extremism that is deploring words when it concerns others, but which shows itself in his most violent and ruthless expression when it is he himself who puts it into practice against clergy and laity connected to the ancient rite and faithful to the sacred tradition towards the society of St. Pius X, he shows himself willing to make conception and to establish a relationship as good neighbors, but towards the poor priest and faithful who have to endure a thousand humiliations and blackmail in order to beg for a mass in Latin, he shows no understanding, no humanity. 
this behavior is not accidental. Archbishop Lefebvre's movement enjoys in his own, its own autonomy and economic independence, and for this reason he has no reason to fear retaliation or commissioners from the Holy See. But the bishops, priests and clerics, incarnated in a diocese or religious order, know that hanging over them is the sword of Damocles of removal from office, dismissal from the ecclesiastical state, and deprivation of their very means of subsistence. Those who have had the opportunity to follow my speeches and declaration know well what my position is on the Council and on the Novus Ordo. But they also know what my background is. My curriculum in the service of the Holy See and my relatively recent awareness of the apostasy and the crisis in which we find ourselves. For this reason, I would like to reiterate my understanding for the spiritual path of those who, precisely because of this situation, cannot or are not yet able to make a radical choice, such as celebrating or attending exclusively the Mass of St. Pius V. Many priests discover the treasure of the Venerable Tridentine Liturgy only when they celebrate it and allow themselves to be permeated by it. And it is not uncommon for an initial curiosity toward the extraordinary form, certainly fascinating due to the solemnity of the rite, to change quickly into the awareness of the death of the words the clarity of the doctrine, the incomparable spirituality that it gives birth to and nourishes in our souls. There is a perfect harmony that words cannot express and that the faithful can understand only in part, <clears throat> but which touches the heart of the priesthood as only God can. This can be confirmed by my confreres who have approached the Usus Antiquior after decades of obedient celebration of the Novus Ordo. A world opens up, a cosmos that includes the prayer of the breviary with the lesson of Matins, the commentaries of the Fathers, the cross-reference to the text of the Mass, the martyrology in the hour of the prayer. They are sacred words, not because they are expressing Latin, but rather they are expressing Latin because the vulgar language would demean them, would profane them, as Don Guéranger wisely observed. These are the words of the bride to the Divine Bridegroom, words of the soul that lives in intimate union with God, of the soul that lets itself be inhabited by the Most Holy Trinity, essentially priestly words in the deepest sense of the term, which implies in the priesthood not only the power to offer sacrifice, but to unite in self-offerings to the pure, holy and immaculate victim. It has nothing to do with the rambling of the reform rite, which is too intent on pleasing the secularized mentality to turn to the majesty of God and to the heavenly court so preoccupied with making itself understandable that one has to give up on communicating anything but tribal obviousness. So careful 
not to hurt the feeling of heretics, as to allow itself to keep silent about the truth just at the moment in which the Lord God makes himself present on the altar. So fearful of asking the faithful for a slighted commitment as to rivalize the second song any artistic expression linked to the worship. The simple fact that the Lutheran pastors, modernist and well-known Freemasons, collaborated in drafting of that right should make us understand, if not the bad faith or the willful and willful misconduct, at least the horizontal mentality devoid of any supernatural impetus which motivated the author of the so-called liturgical reform who, as far as we know, certainly does not shine with the sanctity with which the second author of the text of the ancient Missale Romanum and of the entire liturgical corpus shine. How many of you priests, and certainly also many lay people, in reciting the wonderful verses of the Pentecostal sequence, were moved to tears, understanding that your initial predilection for the traditional liturgy had nothing to do with a sterile aesthetic satisfaction, but had evolved into a real spiritual necessity, as indispensable as breathing. How can you well, how can we explain to those who today would like to deprive you of this priceless good that that blessed right has made you discover the true nature of your priesthood and that from it and only from it you are able to draw strength and nourishment to face the commitments of your ministry. How can you make it clear that the obligatory return to the Montinian rite represent an impossible sacrifice for you? Because in the deadly battle against the world, the flesh and the devil, it leaves you disarmed, prostrated and without strength. It is evident that only those who have not celebrated the Mass of St. Pius V can consider it as an anointing tinsel of the past, which can be done without. Even many young priests, accustomed to the Novus Ordo since their adolescence, have understood that the two forms of the rite have nothing in common, and that one is so superior to the other as to reveal all its limits and criticisms to the point of making it almost painful to celebrate. It is not a question of nostalgia, of a cult of the past. Here we are speaking of the life of the soul, its spiritual growth, ascesis and mysticism, concept that those who are their priesthood, who see their priesthood as a profession, cannot even, even understand, just as they cannot understand the agony that a priest's soul feels in seeing the Eucharistic spaces desecrated during the grotesque rite of communion in the area of the pandemic fast. This is why I find it extremely unpleasant to have to read in the Traditionis Custode that the reason why Francis believes that the motto proprio sumorum pontificum was promulgated 14 years ago lay only in the desire to heal the so-called schism of Archbishop Lefebvre. Of course, the political calculation may have had its weight, especially at the time of John Paul II, even 
If at that time the faithful of the society of St. Pius X were few in number, but the request to be able to restore citizenship to the Mass, which for two millennia nourished the holiness of the faithful and gave the sap of life to Christian civilization, cannot be reduced to a contingent fact. With this motu proprio, Benedict XVI restored the Roman Apostolic Mass to the Church, declaring that it had never been abolished. Indirectly, he admitted that there was an abuse by Paul VI, when in order to give authority to his right, he rooted the slit forbade the celebration of the traditional liturgy. And even in that document, there, are, there may be some incongruent element, such as the coexistence of the two forms of the same rite. We can believe that this has served to allow for the diffusion of the extraordinary form without affecting the ordinary one. In other times, it would have seemed incomprehensible to let a mass steep with the misunderstandings and omission to be celebrated when the authority of the pontiff could have simply restored the ancient rite. But today, with the heavy burden of Vatican II and with the now with widespread secularized mentality, even the mere the sanity of celebration, celebrating the Tridentine Mass without permission can be considered an undeniable good, a good that is visible to all due to the abundant fruits it brings to the community where it is celebrated. As we can also believe that it would have brought even more fruits in finally Summarum Pontificum had been applied in all its point and with a spirit of true ecclesial communion. Francis notes well that the survey taken among bishops all over the world did not yield negative result. Although the formulation of the question made clear what answer he wanted to receive. That consultation was a pretext in order to make people believe that the decision he made was ine inevitable and the fruit of choral request from the Episcopate. We all know that if Bergoglio wants to obtain a result, he does not hesitate to resort to force, lies, as light of hands. The event of the last synods have demonstrated this beyond all reasonable doubt. With the post-synodal exhortation draft even before the vote of the instrumental laboris. Also in this case, therefore, the pre-established purpose was the abolition of the Tridentine Mass and the prophecies, that is, the apparent excuse, had to be the supposed instrumental use of the Roman Missal in 1962, often, often characterized by a rejection not only of the liturgical reform, but of the Vatican Council II itself. In all honesty, one can perchance accuse the Society of St. Pius X of this instrumental use, which has every right to affirm what each of us knows well, that the Mass of St. Pius V is incompatible with the post-conciliar ecclesiology and doctrine. But the Society is not affected by the motu proprio, and has always celebrated use in the 1962 Missal, Precisely by virtue of that inalienable right which Benedict XVI recognized, 
which was not created ex nihilo in 2007. The diocesan priest who celebrates Mass in the church assigned to him by the bishop and who every week must undergo the third degree through the accusation of zealous progressive Catholic only because he has dared to recite the confiteor prior to the ministering communion to the faithful, knows very well that he cannot speak ill of the Novus Ordo or Vatican II, because at the first synod he would already be summoned to the Curia and sent to a parish church lost in the mountains. That silence, always painful and almost always perceived by everyone as more eloquent than many words, is the price that he has to pay in order to have the possibility of celebrating the Holy Mass of all time, in order not to deprive the faithful of the graces that it pours down upon the Church and the world. And what is even more absurd is that while he hear it said with impunity that the Tridentine Mass was to be abolished because of its incompatibility with the ecclesiology of the Vatican II, as soon as we say the same thing, that is, that the Montignan Mass is incompatible with the Catholic ecclesiology, we are immediately made the object of condemnation, and our affirmation is used as evidence against us before the revolutionary tribunal of Santa Marta. I wonder what sort of spiritual disease could distract the shepherds in the last few decades in order to lead them to become not loving father but ruthless censors of their priests, officials constantly watching and ready to revoke all right in virtues of the blackmail that they do not even try to conceal. This climate of suspicion does not in the least contribute to the serenity of many good priests. When the good they do is always placed under the lens of a functionaries who consider the faithful link to the tradition as a danger, as anointing present to be tolerated so long as it does stand out too much. But how can we even conceive of a church in which the good is systematically hindered and whoever does it is viewed with suspicion and kept under control. I therefore understand the scandal of many Catholics faithful and not a few priests in the face of this shepherd who instead of smelling his sheep humbly beats them with a stick. The misunderstanding of being able to enjoy a right, as if it were a gracious concession, may also be found in the public affairs, where the state permits itself to authorize travel, school lessons, the opening of activities, and the performance of work, as long as one undergoes inoculation with the experimental genetic serum. Thus, just thus, the extraordinary form is granted on the condition of accepting the Consul and the Reform Mass. So also in the civil sphere the rights of citizens are granted on the condition of accepting the pandemic narrative, the vaccination, and the tracking systems. It is not surprising that in many cases it is precisely priests and bishops and Bergoglio himself who ask that people be vaccinated in order to access the sacraments. 
the perfect synchrony of action for both sides is disturbing to say the least. But where then is this instrumental use of this Missale Romano? Should we not rather speak of the instrumental use of the Missal of Paul VI, which, to paraphrase, to paraphrase Bergoglio's words, is ever more characterized by a growing rejection not only of the preconceived liturgical tradition, but all the ecumenical council prior to Vatican II? On the other hand, is it not precisely Francis who considers as a threat to the Council the simple fact that a Mass may be celebrated which repudiates and condemns all the doctrinal deviation of Vatican II? Never in the history of the Church did a Council or a liturgical reform constitute a point of rupture between what came before and what came after. Never in the course of these two millennia have a Roman pontiffs deliberately drawn an ideological border between the church that he preceded them and the one they had to govern, cancelling and contradicting the magisterium of their predecessor. The before and after, instead, became an obsession both of those who prudently insinuated doctrinal errors behind equivocal expression, as well as of those who, with boldness of those who believe that they have won, propagated Vatican II as the 1789 of the Church, as prophetic, and a revolutionary event. Before 7 July 2007, in response to the spread of the traditional rite, a well-known pontifical master of ceremonies replied pickedly, there is no going back. And yet, apparently, with Francis, one can go back on the promulgation of some Sumorum Pontificum. And how? If it serves to preserve power and to prevent the good from spreading. It is a slogan which sinisterly echoes the cry of nothing would be as it was before of the pandemic first. Francis' admission of an alleged division between the faithful linked to the Tridentine liturgy and those who largely out and habit or resignation have adapted to the Reformed liturgy is revealing. It does not seek to heal this division by recognizing full rights to a right that is objectively better with respect to Montinian right but precisely in order to prevent the ontological superiority of the Mass of St. Pius V from becoming evident and to prevent the criticism of the Reform Rite and the doctrine it expresses from emerging, he prohibits it. He labels it as div divisive. He confines it to Indian reservation, trying to limit its diffusion as much as possible so that he will disappear completely in the name of the council culture of which the conciliar revolution was the unfortunate forerunner. Not being able to tolerate that the Novus Ordo and the Vatican II emerged inexorably defeated by their confrontation with the Vetus Ordo and the perennial Catholic Magisterium, the only solution that can be adopted is to cancel every trace of tradition, 
relegating it to the nostalgic refuge of some irreducible octogenarian or a clique of eccentrics or presenting it as a pretext as the ideological manifesto of a, minor, a minority of fundamentalists. On one, on the other hand, constructing a media version consistent with the system to be repeated ad nauseam in order to indoctrinate the masses is the recurring element not only in the ecclesiastical sphere but also in the political and civil sphere so that it appears with disconcerting evidence that the deep church and the deep state are nothing other than two parallel tracks which run in the same direction and have as their final destination the new world order with his religion and his prophet. The division is there, obviously. But it does not come from good Catholics and clergy who remain faithful to the doctrine of all time, but rather from those who have replaced orthodoxy with heresy and the holy sacrifice with a fraternal agape. That division is not new today but dates back to the 60s, when the spirit of the Council of Openness to the world and interreligious dialogue turned 2,000 years of Catholicity into a straw and revolutioned the entire ecclesial body, persecuting and ostracizing the, the, the refractory. Yet, that division accomplished by bringing doctrine and liturgical confusion into the heart of the Church, it does not seem so deplorable then. Why today, in full apostasy, they are paradoxically considered divisive was not for explicit condemnation of Vatican II and Novus Ordo, but simply the tolerance of the Mass in the extraordinary form, in the name of the much vaunted polyedric pluralism. Significantly, even in the civilized world, the protection of minority is valid only when they serve to demolish traditional society, while such protection is ignored when it would guarantee the legitimate rights of honest citizens. And it has become clear that under the pretext of the protection of minorities, the only intention was to weaken the majority of the good. Why now that the majority is made up by those who are corrupt, the minority of the good can be crushed without mercy. Recent history does not lack illuminated precedent in this regard. In my opinion, it is not so much this or that point of the motu proprio that is disconcerting, but rather its overall tyrannical nature accompanied by a substantial falsity of arguments put forward to justify the decision imposed. Scandal is also given by the abuse of power, by an authority that has its own reason that, not in impeding or limiting the graces that are bestowed on its adherent to the Church, but rather in promoting those graces not in taking away glory from Divine Majesty with a right that winks to the Protestants, but rather in rendering that glory perfectly, not in sowing doctrine or moral error, but rather in condemning and eradicating them. Here too, 
the parallel with what takes place in the civil world is all too evident. Our rulers abuse their power just as our prelates do, imposing norms and limitations in violation of the most basic principle of law. Furthermore, it is precisely those who are constituted in authority on both fronts who often avail themselves of a mere de facto recognition by the rank and file, citizens and faithful, even when the methods by which they have taken power violate, if not the latter, then at least the spirit of the law. The case of Italy in which a non-elected government legislator on the obligation to be vaccinated and on the Green Pass, violating the Italian constitution and the natural rights of the Italian people, does not seem very dissimilar to the situation in which the Church finds herself with a resigned pontiffs replaced by Jorge Mario Gregorio, chosen, or at least appreciated and supported, by the St. Gallen Mafia and the ultra-progressive Episcopate. It remains obvious that there is a profound crisis of authority, both civil and religious, in which those who exercise power do so contrary to those whom they are supposed to protect, and above all contrary to the purpose of, for which that authority has been established. I think that it has been understood that both civil society and the Church suffers from the same cancer that struck the former with the French Revolution and the latter with the Second Vatican Council. In both cases, Masonic thought is at the foundation of the systematic demolition of the institution and its replacement with a simulacrum that maintains its external appearances, hierarchical structure and coercive force, but with purposes diametrically opposed to those he ought to have. At this point, citizens of the one hand and the faithful on the other find themselves in condition of having to disobey earthly authority in order to obey divine authority, which governs nations and the Church. Obviously, the reaction is that it is those who do not accept the perversion of authority and want to remain faithful to the Church of Christ and to their homeland constitute an element of dissent that cannot be tolerated in any way and therefore they must be discredited, delegitimized, threatened and deprived of their right in the name of a public good that is no longer the bonum comune, but is contrary. Whether accused of conspiracy terrorists, terrorists, traditionalism, or fundamentalism, these few survivors of a world that they want to make disappear constitutes a threat to the accomplishments of the global plan. Just as the most crucial moment of his realization. This is why power is reacting in such an open, brazen and violent way. The evidence of the fraud is being understood by a greater number of people bringing them together in an organized resistance 
or breaking down the wall of silence and ferocious censorship imposed by the mainstream media. We can therefore understand the violence of the reaction of authority and prepare ourselves for a strong and determined opposition, continuing to avail ourselves to those rights that have been abusively and illicitly denied us. Of course, we may find ourselves having this to exercise those rights in an incomplete way. When you are denied the opportunity to travel, if we do not have our green pass, or if the, if the bishop prohibits us from celebrating the mass on full time in a church in his diocese. But our resistance to abuses of authority will still be able to count on the graces that the Lord will not cease to grant us. In particular, the virtue of the fortitude that is so indispensable in times of tyranny. If on the one hand we can see how the persecution of dissenters is well organized and planned, on the other hand, we cannot fail to recognize the fragmentation of the opposition. Bergoglio knows well that every movement of dissent must be silenced, above all by creating internal division and isolating priests and the faithful. A fruitful and fraternal collaboration between diocese and clergy, religious, and the Ecclesia Dei Institute is something it must avert because it would permit the diffusion of the knowledge of the ancient right, and well as precious help in the ministry. But this would mean making the Tridentine Mass a normality in the daily life of the faithful, something that is not terrible for Francis. For this reason, diocesan clergy are left at the mercy of their ordinaries, while the Ecclesia Dei Institute are placed under the authority of the Congregation for Religions as a sad prelude to a destiny that has already been sealed. Let us not forget the fate that befell the flourishing religious orders, guilty of being blessed with numerous vocations born and nurtured precisely thanks to the hated traditional liturgy and the faithful observance of the rule. This is why certain form of insistence on the ceremonial aspect of the celebration risk legitimizing the provision of the commissar and play Bergoglio's game. Even in the civil world, it is precisely by encouraging certain excesses by the dissenters that those in power marginalize them and legitimize repressive measures towards them. Just think of the case of the Novax movement and how easy it is to discredit the legitimate protest of citizens by emphasizing the eccentricities and inconsistencies of a few. It is all too easy to condemn a few agitated people who out of exasperation set fire to a vaccine center, overshadowing millions of honest persons who take to the street in order not to be branded with the health passport or fire if they do not allow themselves to be vaccinated. Another important element for all of us is the necessity of giving visibility to our composed protest and ensure a form of coordination for public action. With the abolition of the Sumorum Pontificum, 
we find ourselves taken back 20 years. This unhappy decision by Bergoglio to cancel the motu proprio of Pope Benedict is doomed to inexorable failure because it touches the very soul of the Church of which the Lord himself is pontiff and high priest. It is not a given that the entire episcopate, as we are seeing in the last few days with the relief, will be willing to passively submit the, to form of the authoritarianism that certainly do not contribute to bringing peace to soul. The Code of Canon Law guarantees the bishops the possibility of dispensing their faithful from particular or universal law under certain conditions. Secondly, the people of God have well understood the subversive nature of traditionis custodes and are instinctively led to want to get to know something that arouses such disapproval among progressives. Let us not be surprised, therefore, if we soon begin to see the faithful coming for ordinary parish life, and even those far from the Church, finding their way to the churches where the traditional man Mass is celebrated. It will be our duty, whether as minister of God or as simple faithful, to show firmness and serene resistance to such abuse, walking along the way of our own little Calvary with a supernatural spirit, with a new high priest, why the new white high priest and scribes of the people mock us and label us as fanatics. It will be our humility the silent offering of injustice toward us and the example of life consistent with the creed that we profess that will merit the triumph of the Catholic Mass and the conversion of many souls. And let us remember that since we have received much, much will be demanded of us. What father among you, if his son, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent instead? Now we can understand better the meaning of these words. Considering with pain and torment of heart the cynicism of a father who gives us the stones of a soulless liturgy, the serpents of a corrupted doctrine, and the scorpion of an adulterate morality, and who reaches the point of dividing the flock of the Lord between those who accept the Novus Ordo and those who want to remain faithful to the Mass of our fathers. Exactly as civil rulers are pitting the vaccinated and unvaccinated against one another. When our Lord entered Jerusalem, seated on a donkey's colt, while the crowds was spreading cloaks as he passed, the Pharisees asked him, Master, rebuke your disciples. The Lord answered them, I say to you, that if his teeth are silent, the stone will cry out. For sixty years the stone of our churches have been cried out. 
from which the only sacrifice has been twice proscribed. The marble of the altars, the column of the basilicas, and the soaring vaults of the cathedrals cry out as well, because those stones consecrated to the worship of the true God today are abandoned or deserted, or profaned by abhorrent rites, or transformed into parking lots or supermarkets, precisely as a result of that council that we insist of defending. Let us also cry out, we who are living stones of the temple of God, let us cry out with faith to the Lord, so that he may give a voice to his disciples who today are mute, and so that the terrible death for which the administration of the Lord's vineyard are responsible may be repaired. But in order for that theft to be repaired, it is not necessary that we show ourselves to be worthy of the treasures that have been stolen from us. Let us try to do this by our holiness of life, by giving example of the virtues, by prayer and frequent reception of the sacrament. And let us not forget that there are hundreds of good priests who still know the meaning of the sacred unction by which they have been ordained ministers of Christ and dispenser of the mystery of God. Lord deigns to descend on our altars, even when they are erected in cellars or attics. Contraries we Muslim minime obstantibus. Anything to the contrary notwithstanding.